John chapter 15. Let's go there. In the time we have remaining, which isn't a lot, <laughs> but uh, I didn't plan on going very far this morning in John 15. We have been, as I said, looking at this private ministry of Jesus to those whom he loves. And it's these first five, these uh, five chapters in John, in the upper room discourse, as he's celebrating the Passover. And when we were in this text last time, we realized that they've left the upper room at the end of chapter 14, verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father. And as the Father gave me commandment, so I do. Arise, let us go from here. He left the upper room. He's going to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane means olive press. It's where his life is going to be pressed. He's going to feel the pressures of what's going to be taking place. And he says, Father, if this cup, if, if, if this cup would pass from me. <laughs> But nevertheless, thy will, thy will be done. He surrendered to the Lord's will. So he's going to make his way over there, and he's making way, he's going down the mount, across the Kidron Valley and up the Mount of Olives. And during that time in Jesus' lifetime, that whole hillside was what? It was a vineyard. It was a grapevine. The whole thing was a vineyard. And that's why in chapter uh, 15, he begins by talking about he is the true vine. He is the true bread. He is the true light. If there's anything that's genuine, true, and authentic, it is Jesus. There's so much that is so fake in our world today, isn't it? There's so much hypocrisy. There's so much falsehood, deceit. But Jesus is the true, the true vine. He is the vine. You are the branches. And, and his desire is that you bear fruit. You bear fruit. You bear much fruit. You bear mucho fruit, the text tells us, right? But how do you bear that fruit? Do you have to work at it? You have to strain? Hmm? No, all you, all you need to do is cling to the vine. Abide. And we talked about abiding in prayer, right? Abide in obedience to his word. Abide in his joy. And then you'll abide in his love. And that's the fullness of our life with Christ. Godliness with contentment is great joy, right? That's the abundant life Jesus came to offer us. Godliness with contentment. And our life is a life of prayer. Our life is a life of obedience to his word. Our, our life is a life of joy and love. Nothing can steal true joy. Happiness is temporary, right? Happiness depends upon the outward circumstance. Happiness may depend for some people on what they open up under the tree Christmas morning, right? But true joy has nothing to do with any of that. Joy is found in sensing the pleasure God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has for your life. You, you remember those times? We wish it would be constant. But, but you remember those very specific times or instances where you sensed the Lord's pleasure for your life? that you were doing exactly what he intended and wanted you to do, and, and you knew you felt you had the Lord's pleasure. I think of Eric Lindell, The Chariots of Fire. How many have ever seen the movie, read the book, right? And, and, and he, was he was preparing for what ministry? China missions. He was preparing his life to go to China as a missionary, but he was also preparing himself physically for what? The Olympics. The Olympics. He was a runner. He was a world-class runner. He had very few people in the world were his equal, if anybody, right? And his sister was so upset that he was training for the Olympics rather than paying more attention to preparing for the mission field. But he said to her, oh, Jenny, 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 you don't understand. I'm going to China, and I will go to China. Prepare, Jenny. He's got that, that Irish accent or whatever it was, right? I'm preparing to go to China, Jenny. But then he said, but you need to understand, God made me for China, but he made me to run. Not me, him. Right? <laughs> you remember that? And he said, but God made me for China, but God made me to run. And when I run, what did he say? I feel his pleasure. I sense his pleasure for my life. Yeah. Do you, do you remember those times when, when you know you're, exa you're doing exactly what God has called you to do and you feel his pleasure, his joy? That's, jo that's Christian joy. Being in the Lord's pleasure. Well, we looked at that uh, first section of chapter 15 and we ended it, I think we ended around verse uh, 11, but I want to pick it up in 9, okay? 
And I have a heading in my Bible. Do you have one in yours? At verse 9, what does it say? One at a time. I can't hear you. Love and joy perfected. Precisely what we're talking about. Love and joy perfected. What is this, the theme, theme this week? Love. Agapeo. Agape love. God's love. Now, now you need to understand that the Greek word agape or agapeo, it, it, it expresses a love that is unconditional, sacrificial. It is a love that you, you give to something, an object, a person that, that, that has no equal and you're willing to give anything for it. And there's no conditions, unconditional, sacrificial. So it's not necessarily God's love because in later on in John, well, earlier in John's gospel in chapter three, he said, for men agapeo, darkness rather than the light for the deeds are evil. How can you love unconditionally, sacrificially darkness? Give me an example. Yes, that's right. Drugs. <laughs> Whoever said that? You didn't say that. <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can look at the number of people who would, who would do anything for their drug of choice to get that high. They love that drug and they love that high unconditionally, sacrificially. Alcohol, uh, sexual pleasure, money, position, pride. You, you can love darkness in the same way you can love God. But where should our love be directed? Towards God, of course, of course. So in verse nine, let's go there. Chapter 15, for as the father loved me, the father loved Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, three times God spoke from heaven. This is my beloved son, the son that I love. We've been translated from darkness to the kingdom of the light of the son of his love, right? Ephesians tells us. Yes. As the father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. So with the same love that the father has for Christ, Christ loves us. Why did the father love Christ? Well, verse 10 really tells us, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Hmm. So we can demonstrate our love for God by what we say? No, by what we do. Look at chapter 17 for a minute. Chapter 17 of John's Gospel. The Father's love for the Son, verse 26, I have declared to them your name, Jesus speaking to the Father, and, and will declare it, that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Hmm. So being a Christian and experiencing the love of Jesus is the same way Jesus came and experienced the love of the Father by being obedient. Love equals obedience. Do you understand that? That's why I'm always encouraging you, Chapel family, listen with your eyes. Don't listen with your ears. You'll be deceived very quickly. Oh, people can make the most grandiose claims, right? But you watch a person's life. We live what we believe. And, and you will demonstrate what you love in the way in which you live. Is that not true? Jesus is saying, I've demonstrated the love that I have for my father in that I've obeyed him. And, and because I've obeyed him, I have experienced his pleasure, his joy in my life, and my joy is full. That's precisely what he's going to say. Look, look at the next verse, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy remain in you, and that your joy may be full. Experiencing that abundant life, godliness, and contentment. Recognizing that God is sovereign and he's, he's determined the course of our life. He's determined exactly who I am. If God wanted me to have a neck, he would have given me one. And so I'm happy being different from the rest of you. you know? And they made a shampoo just for me, head and shoulders. <laughs> That's how special I am. <laughs> no, but, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't get distracted. You don't know what I'm saying to you, right? Your joy is his joy. As you experience the pleasure of the Lord in doing exactly what he wants you to do, you're overjoyed as well. You know, there's no, no greater joy when a father knows that, that their children are walking in obedience to, to our will, right? 
Yeah, nothing can grieve my heart more as a father than when my child was disobedient, when he wasn't walking in the way I would expect him to go. But when he would turn from his own selfish desires or the temptations that this world would bombard him with, and he would walk in the will of his father on earth and his father in heaven, oh, what joy. John will write in his uh, first Johannine epistle that I have no, no, second Johannine epistle, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk with the Lord. There's no greater joy. Well, the same thing is true of God the Father was overjoyed that the Son came willfully surrendering himself to the will of the Father. Jesus is overjoyed when we come to him and willfully surrender our life to him into his will. The world is desperately seeking examples of men and women who would live that way. Those of you who traveled with us on the bus yesterday, you saw the testimony of a man who lived that way, completely surrendered to the will of God, tempted to be a movie star, tempted to run for the presidency, tempted to be, be uh, riches and fame galore. No. No, no. I live for one purpose now, for the joy of my father in sharing his love for the world. <clears throat> yes, these things I have spoken to you that my joy remain in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus was obedient to the Father, and he received the Father's love. We're to be obedient to Jesus and receive his love. He said we're to love one another as he has loved us. How has he loved us? I'm sorry? Why? To pay for our sins. So when he paid that price, the propitiation for our sins, right? Appeasing the offended power because of who I am, we call that forgiveness, right? Right? So how has Jesus loved us? He's loved us by forgiving us when we come to him. Therefore, what should we do if we're going to love one another? So if I've offended you, what do you need to do? Forgive me. And if you've offended me, what am I to do? Boy, don't we have a difficult time doing that. Why? Because, well, I, listen, it's not innate within us as human beings. But listen, we, we have now the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to love like no one else can love in this world unless they have the power of the Holy Spirit. A love that is a forgiving love. Now, I don't want you to tell me, but I know that you could sit here and begin to think about the number of offenses sins that you have committed against God and Jesus has forgiven you all. All your past sin, your present, and your future. Now, not that we presume upon the grace of God, not that we want to sin, no. No, we want to do everything to walk in obedience to his word, but if he's forgiven me of the mountain of sin that I know I've committed against him, how could I take offense that Nathan made a mistake last week in worship? Did you make a mistake last week? Every week. Every week. Oh, okay, all right, all right. So I was speaking truthfully. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I didn't notice. And it wasn't really an offense. <laughs> Listen to me. Who is it? Who is it you're having a hard time forgiving? Who is it in the hardness of your own heart you don't want to forgive? You enjoy that resentment. You enjoy that unforgiveness. You know, that's a very fleshly thing, isn't it? To be resentful to hold a grudge, to keep a record of wrongs, right? But Jesus said, love one another as... Well, well, Peter said, Lord, Lord, how many times do I need to forgive my brother? Seven times seven? Peter think, thought he was being gracious, didn't he? And what did Jesus say? No, he said seven times, and Jesus said 70 times seven. Jesus said innumerable we have to constantly forgive. Now, now, it doesn't mean that you can be reconciled. Do you understand the difference between forgiveness and reconciliation? Sometimes just waking up in the morning, I offend my wife. You know. 
No, no, no. It, you know, you know, you were guys. You know how guys are. You know. And, and then I just asked, "Will you forgive me?" I didn't yet, no. but I will. Don't worry. It's been early. It's early. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she says it's her. I say it's me. She says it's her. That's the way it's supposed to be, isn't it? But we're to continually forgive one another. Now, now, if I offer forgiveness to someone I have offended and they won't forgive me, there's, there's not anything I can do about that situation, is there? But the forgiveness can still be within my heart. I can still forgive. I can still love them as Christ has loved me. If they refuse to reconcile with me, that's on them now, isn't it? Jesus has come to offer that forgiveness. Now, there, there are some who will accept that forgiveness and reconcile with him, but many refuse. So they're still outside of a relationship with him because they can't be reconciled. Reconciliation takes all parties involved, two or more. What about forgiving yourself? How many parties is that? You get, you get into it in the text in Ephesians where he says you to put off the old man and put on the new man. How many people does that imply? Well, you got one person putting off the old man. You got that same person who put off the old man putting on the new man. So there's at least three of you in there. <laughs> I just, food for thought. <laughs> this is the commandment that I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down one's life for his friends. The text tells that Abraham in Hebrews, it says Abraham believed God and he was declared righteous because he believed God. Believe God where? In his heart. That's where, listen, that's where it's going to change your life. Not in your head, it's in your heart. And so he believed God and was reckoned to him or accounted to him as righteousness and he became, he was called the friend of God. The word phileo means friend. A love, a love of friendship, love of family, phileo friend philos are you a friend of God how do we demonstrate that we are a friend of God by being obedient to God our obedience to God demonstrates that we love God do you understand you're getting it if you're not obedient to God in his word you don't love him no matter what you say so often uh, I will say please forgive me and my wife will say don't tell me show me show me because then it's a real demonstration of my desire to be forgiven and to turn and to change and to love do you understand that a lot of people feel just because they intellectually assent to Jesus Christ and what he's offering you in this peace, in this reconciliation between the two, and you can make a, a public proclamation without really surrendering your life, you're saved. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The demonstration of your salvation is not in your public profession, although you should have a public profession. My son was talking to a relative on his wife's side yesterday, 84-year-old man who's lived a life of sin, but now he's getting older. He recognizes his mortality, and he began to talk to my son about the seriousness of life, getting right with God, and said, well, do you think that you could baptize me? But can the water be warm? <laughs> I suppose at 84, you don't want to be baptized in cold water. <laughs> the shock might kill him. <laughs> But, but listen to me, that, that, that. he wanted to demonstrate he wants to change his life, and his life has been changing, he's been thinking about these things, and God has been speaking to him. So it's, it's not what you profess, it's not what you believe in your head, it's what you believe in your heart, and it changes your life. Everyone will know you're a different person. Share the gospel, and sometimes use words. You ever hear that? So how do we share the gospel? The gospel through our life. But then we get the opportunity to give our testimony. There's a lot of people who have a profession, but no possession of the Holy Spirit. It's wah, 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 wah. It's just noise. Clanging cymbal, right? 
You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer will I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Wasn't it interesting? The first miracle Jesus ever performed was what? Putting water into wine. Who knew about that? I'm sorry, just the servants. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. And so often we see in the gospel when Jesus does things, it's, it's just those who are called servants but believe in their heart who he is that realize the miracle that taken place. Yeah, the work of Jesus. Now, we're no longer called servants. We're called friends. Why? Because God has revealed in his word all that we need to know for life and godliness. What the future holds here. You want to be able to interpret what is happening in our world? This march to global communism? Yeah, that's what's happening. Well, the Bible predicts that's exactly what would happen. This march to global communism. Yeah, that the whole world is going to fall into this way of. But I'm so thankful that my father has revealed to me ahead of time. Do you know how many people are ignorant of these things? Amos said in the latter days, in the end times... Just before the coming of Christ, there'll be a famine. A famine not of bread, a famine not of water, a famine of the... And not that there'll be a famine of the word itself. We have the word, don't we? We have the capacity now, like never before, to interpret well over 90% of the word of God very accurately using the principles of hermeneutics, not twisting or, or mutilating the text. <laughs> but so few who claim his name have any working knowledge of the text of the word of God a famine of the hearing but Jesus would say with regard to the last days let him who has a ear hear what the spirit is saying to the church that's why I say the body of Christ has an ear to hear the body of Christ is aware of what is happening in our day are you a friend or are you a servant is the word of God still a mystery to you and the will and the workings of Christ or are you completely aware of what Jesus is doing and about to do? Hmm? That's because you're a friend and not a servant. Verse 16, this causes a lot of indigestion for people. <laughs> you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you, ordained you, that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. We're celebrating the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, right? So that we would be birthed of heaven. The sovereignty of God in election or the free will of man in exercising his freedom of choice. How do you reconcile those two? How do you process that? Just, just recognize that he chose you, that your salvation was a work of God, resting in it. It's settled. You believe once saved, always saved? I, I truly believe that. I believe once saved, always and forever saved. So you can never lose the gift of God that has been given to you, can you? No. Now, you, you listen, you're one bad choice away from beginning to act like that old man or old woman all over again, you render yourself completely ineffective for God, but you're saved. Is that true? Can that happen? Yes. Sure it can. Sure it can. Well, I don't want to take that chance. I'm going to rest in my salvation knowing God has saved me, but at the same time, I'm going to work out my salvation in fear and trembling. No, it's God who works within me, both the will and to do. I want to demonstrate to the whole world I'm saved. I want there to be enough evidence in a court of law that if I were convicted of being a Christian, it would be overwhelming. The jury would deliberate for about 60 seconds. Guilty, he's a Christian. <laughs> Wouldn't you want that? Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean because you recognize the sovereignty of God in election, in salvation, that he chose you, that you sit on your hands and do nothing. Now you yield yourself like a Billy Graham, like so many others before and since, to allow God to work within you both to will and to do. 
There's much that he would like to do through your life. I, I'll never. In my entire lifetime, I won't speak to 1,100,000 people ever. But God will use me to speak to some. And, you know, the ministry that I enjoy more than any other is not here on a Sunday morning. It's a one-on-one -on -one ministry that I have with so many of my brothers. I so enjoy that. that ministry of presence, that personal ministry, that discipleship, that, that's what I enjoy more than anything else. You know. But knowing that God chose you does not give you the freedom to sit on your hands and do nothing. We have an obligation to cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit in our life to accomplish the will that God has for our life. Do you understand? How you doing? Don't answer me. You just think about it. Hmm? Why? So that you would bear fruit. Is that fruit taking scalps? Have you seen my belt that I notched? No. Is that the fruit? No. Do you save anybody? No. No. Who saves? God. That takes all the pressure off, doesn't it? So what is the fruit? Love, joy, peace. Turn to Galatians chapter 5. The fruit that God desires to come forth from your life and mine. And those closest to us should be experiencing that fruit more than any other. In chapter 5 of Galatians, he talks about the, the deeds of the flesh or the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, he begins, Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, fruit singular here, now he's going to describe it, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there's no law. Nobody will ever say, that's enough love. That's enough peace. That's enough joy. That's enough self-control. <laughs> no. But those first three adjectives describing this love of God, love, joy, peace, what does that talk about? What is that representing? My relationship to God. Joy, J-O-Y. What does that stand for? Jesus, others, you last, right? If you understand true joy, true joy is putting Jesus first, serving others, and, and you don't worry about yourself. The love, joy, and peace that is talked about in this first three adjectives describing this fruit of the Spirit speaks of my relationship to Christ. Only Christ can produce that love that I'm to have as I'm to love as he loves me. Only Christ can produce a love that's unconditional, sacrificial, I love myself, don't you? Didn't you wake up this morning thinking about me? <laughs> now, in my flesh, that's what I think, right? That I'm the most important person in the world, and I'm the one you think about. No, in Christ, we recognize that our love has to be for God first. And therefore, that love, joy, peace that comes from God will be manifest in my life. It will exist in my heart and my life. There'll be a skip in my step. There'll be a song in my heart. You understand? You'll be a happy person. When, when you see a miserable person, they're not in a relationship with God that they should be. They call themselves Christian, yet they're absolutely miserable. Why? They're not. They're outside of the relationship with God, outside of the will of God. In their, they can be saved, but they're not walking in harmony with God, and therefore, they're miserable. But this love, joy, peace that comes, it only comes through my relationship to him, the personal ministry of Jesus in my heart and life. Now, the next three, what is that? Patience, goodness, kindness. This word patience, hupomone, means long. Well, I hate that, don't you? I don't ever want to put long and suffering together. Quickly suffer. I like that. I like that, you know? Yeah. I always warn my dentist before he works on me. Look, I don't like pain. I feel pain. You feel pain. <laughs> he laughs, but I'm not. I'm kidding. <laughs> long suffering. Did Jesus not suffer long with me? How could I not suffer long with others? It's easy with Gail. You know. Uh, you know what I say? You know, God's called us to love everybody, hasn't he? There's just some people I like a whole lot more. <laughs> They're just easier to like. <laughs> oh, but I'm to love and like everyone, aren't I? 
long-suffering, goodness, kindness. That doesn't speak of my relationship to God. That speaks of my relationship to others, everyone else. Jesus, others, you last. And then lastly, when he's describing this fruit, now, now we get down to my relationship to myself. And what does he say there? Faithfulness, gentleness. What is gentleness? Me, ick, meek. Me, ick, right? That's how you spell meek, right? Faithfulness, gentleness, meekness. What's the last one? Oh, wow. So you see, the, the fruit that God wants you to display in your life, there is a priority. There's an interworking of the relationship. They're all related one to another. It's first your relationship to God, love, joy, peace. Second, your relationship to others. Long-suffering, goodness, kindness. And then, and then your relationship to yourself, how you see yourself. Faithfulness. It's required of a steward What? To simply be found faithful. Billy Graham was faithful to what God called him to do. Are you being faithful to what God has called you to do? That peace in God. Now, I, I know I'm, I'm being faithful. By his strength and his power, I'm being faithful to what he has called me to do. Faithfulness. Meekness. Trying to, to daily recognize all I really have to offer him is my sinfulness, my wretchedness, my lostness, but he works his power, his wonder, his work in my life. Is that not true? And then self-control. Setting up those fences, whatever they have to be, to make sure that I'm not tempted beyond my ability to control, that, that he promised me that he won't allow me to be tempted beyond my ability to control it, but there's things I have to do to set up Parameters are fences in my life. I do not give me a gift card to a grocery store. I'll fill my freezer with ice cream. <laughs> but I have a governor that watches over that. <laughs> are you fruitful? Are you abiding in that vine to where you're producing that fruit for God, that fruit towards others? And that fruit that should exist in your own life personally. The season of God's love, love one another as I have loved you, requires that we yield to God and purpose to forgive and purpose to be long-suffering, purpose to be kind and good towards others. Listen, won't that be a shock to the world if we start demonstrating that? What's happening today? All of the divisions that exist in our society, in our nation today, the violence, the criminality, it's unbelievable. But we have the opportunity to show them true love, God's love. Back to the text and we'll close here. Yes, you did not chose, choose me, but I chose you and appointed or ordained you that you should go and bear fruit and yet your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Wow. Boy, don't the blab it and grab it, lip it and grip it. Name it and claim it. People take advantage of that text. Don't they? Now, what does it mean to ask in his name? According to his nature. What, what did you want to pray about earlier? What, what were you talking about? Christina and Glenn? That's in his nature, isn't it? That's an other-centered prayer. When we're praying in his name, we always pray in his nature, and his desire is to save. He didn't come to condemn the world. He told us that. But to say that, now the next time he's coming to condemn the world. But there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. And when we truly do pray in his will, he gives us the request that we ask for, and those salvations will be forever. Isn't that wonderful? The fruit. The fruit of those prayers. You see, a lot of people who are falling to a gospel that's not the true gospel. It's another gospel. And, and then the fruitfulness of their life doesn't last. It wanes. And then, then, then it dies because it wasn't of the Lord. But when we are praying in the will of God, when we are living life in the power of God, then the effect that we will have on people through the power of the Holy Spirit in our life will be forever. It'll remain 
It's for certain you brought nothing into this world, and it's certain what? You're taking nothing out, except, except the people who we loved with God's love, the people who we've shared the gospel with, the people who we've shared our life with. We're going to take them with us. Isn't that a wonderful thing? You have some lost family members? Let them know how much you love them and that you want to spend forever with them. Not just this life. Jacob said, this life has been full of trouble. Difficult and full of trouble. Is that true? Yeah. Interspersed between all of the trouble and the difficulty of this life. We have some, some joy, don't we? But oh, but the life to come. Joy, joy, joy. Never a concerning thought, never a fearful thought, never an anxious thought, never, ever, ever. Just love, joy, and peace. Hey, hey, to your saved loved ones, are you explaining to them that that's where you would like them to spend eternity with you? That's what you're offering them? Now, it doesn't work when you tell them they're going to burn in hell forever, but you got to tell them that. That's, that's where you start. Because if you don't accept Christ, then you're under the judgment of your sins personally. Christ hasn't paid for your sins. And no one who enters in before God in their sin can enter into his kingdom. You'll come before God, all roads lead to God, but then from there on, where do you go? <laughs> right? Death. Every person who dies comes before the Lord. And then the judgment. The judgment. Whether you have accepted the work of Christ for your redemption upon the cross, or whether you want to stand in your own righteousness, which you have none, right? That, that's what you explain, but you explain that lovingly, that we want to spend forever with you. These things I command you, now he said it twice, verily, verily, whenever he emphasizes anything twice, he wants you to pay attention. Verse 17, he says it again, these things I command you, that you what? Assignment, go home, this week and look up all of the one another commands in the Bible. There's something like 60 of them. They can only be fulfilled in a communion, in a family relationship. Give me a couple. He just gave you one. Love one another. Pray for one another. Forgive one another, help one another. Look at all of the one another commands in the Bible. They can only be fulfilled in the family as we really, truly love one another. Now, if the world starts to see that kind of a relationship in this family, what do you think they'll want to do? They'll want to join the family. Right? All right. You've been commissioned now. You heard the command. Go and love one another. Recklessly, radically, right? We got a closing song? Who's doing the closing song this morning? Pastor David, come on forward. Shall we stand?